Welcome to today's session on uh, Islam and Democracy. Uh, the meeting we're holding today is uh, managed by Parvaz community. We're indeed very delighted to have Dr. Surush Dabbaf uh, today here in Gothenburg. He's truly one of the most well-known Iranian scholars in uh, moral philosophy, religious intellectualism, and philosophy of uh, language. Uh, Surush Dabbaf, born in 1974, studied pharmaceutics at the University of Tehran, Iran. In 2002, he continued his studies in the field of moral philosophy at the University of Warwick, England. He's currently doing his postdoctoral fellowship on contemporary Muslim thoughts and morality at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, if I pronounce it right. Well, we'll first listen to Dr. Dabal's talk and then take the questions afterwards. Dr. Dabal, please. Okay, well, good afternoon. Uh, I am very pleased to, to be here and just have a dialogue and conversation together with regard to one of the controversial topics in contemporary world, which is Islam and democracy. I tried to give an outline of what I mean by the relationship between Islam and democracy in about 45 minutes or so and then hopefully we will have a discussion which comes afterwards. Um, let me start in this way that when we want to talk about the relationship between Islam and democracy we have to clarify what we mean by both Islam and democracy in the first place. I try to shed light on these concepts very quickly and then go into details and compare different aspects or let's say different relationship between Islam and democracy according to Muslim scholars or what is going on in the real world as far as politicians and political activists are concerned. Um, religion in general actually and Islam in particular, and democracy, are socially constructed concepts. This is one point which has to be taken into account in the first place. What I mean by saying the point of Islam and democracy are socially constructed concepts is that each con these concepts does these concepts do not have any essence and a priori definition and definition and constituents. In other words, if we want to take a distinction, semantic distinction, let's say, from philosophy of language, we can pull apart natural kinds on the one hand and socially constructed concepts on the other. Let me explain it and give you an example to make it more clear. For instance, um, gold is a natural kind I mean, something which can be found in the real world. According to some philosophers, or according to one interpretation, these concepts are natural kinds. What we mean by natural kind is that each concept has got different constituents or components, which can be distinguished and talked about a priori. What I mean by a priori is before going to, or before I mean, uh, taking part in the, what is going on in reality. A priori means something which is before um, experience. So, for instance, if you think that gold, for instance, has got an essence, it means that you can't count, you can't talk about different constituents and components of the concept gold, for instance. According to this uh, dichotomy or according to this semantic dichotomy. On the other hand, we have got socially constructed concepts. What we mean by socially constructed concepts is we are talking about the concepts which origins or emerge just within the humanistic or within the uh, humanist community. For instance, concepts like democracy, secularism, intellectuality, and so on and so forth. They are socially constructed concepts. 
it follows from this that they haven't got a priori and a pre-existing patterns of, of uh, pre-existing patterns in which the whole constituents and components of these concepts are listed. Um, Wittgenstein, a uh, well-known Austrian-British philosopher, in his book, Philosophical Investigations, introduced the notion of family resemblance. By family resemblance, he means this kind of socially constructed concepts do not have any essence. Though they have got different constituents and components, but it doesn't follow from this that you can list the whole constituents and components. For instance, consider the concept game and what we mean by game in our ordinary language and the way in which language users use and utilize these concepts in different con contexts. You could talk about different constituents of game, but it's context depend dependent. Just you can talk about different constituents and components of the concept game a posteriori. What we mean by a posteriori is just referred to and looking at what is going on in the real world. For instance, you have got the constituent losing or winning in games, or team, or uh, for instance, ball, or hamlet, and so on and so forth. You cannot list them thoroughly in advance. You cannot talk about the whole constituents of the concept game in advance, because it entirely depends on the context and the ways in which these constituents are compound, compound together, the ways in which they are connected to each other different contexts, where you have got football, basketball, uh, snooker, boxing, chess, and so on and so forth. All of these phenomena are different examples of the concept game, though there is no such a thing as a common feature or common features amongst them. So, this is, I mean, uh, one philosophical distinction which sounds relevant to what we are talking about. In the line of this argument, let's say, we can talk about Islam and democracy, two different concepts, which are socially constructed concepts. What we mean by this, according uh, to our discussion, there are, though there are different constituents and con uh, elements of both Islam and democracy, it doesn't follow from this that we have got just exact and predefined, let's say, and predetermined constituents and components of these two socially constructed concepts, which can be talked about in advance. So in reality, we have got democracies, we have got Islams, we have got secularisms, we have got liberalisms, and so on and so forth. There is no just one democracy, there is no just one reading of democracy, there is no just one reading of Islam, there is no just one reading of secularism, and so on and so forth. So, when we are talking about the relationship between Islam and democracy, we have to bear in mind that we can talk about different accounts of each of two of these two, uh, socially constructed concepts. Okay. Next step. If you buy what I try to put forward as the distinction between natural kinds and socially constructed concepts, I'm talking about Islam and democracy, a socially constructed concept, it's me, it's, it follows from this that as far as Islams and democracies are concerned, we have got different versions, different interpretations and readings of Islam and democracy. I don't want to go into details with regard to different types of democracies in this talk. It sounds irrelevant or at least it sounds, I mean, not very crucial to what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to focus on different versions of Islam, which sounds relevant to our discussion and the way in which we could categorize the distinction and the relationship between Islam and democracy. At least, it seems that we can distinguish three readings and interpretations of Islam, which sounds relevant to our contemporary discussion. Uh, I refer to them as fundamentalist reading, traditionalist reading and reformist reading okay so when we want to talk about Islam and its relationship between uh, its relationship the relationship between Islam and democracy 
we can and we have to talk about different versions of Islam and the ways in which they could categorize the relationship between Islam and democracy. Following Descartes, if you have heard of uh, this great um, French philosopher, divide conquer. So as Descartes puts it, so when we want to talk about the relationship between Islam and democracy, we have to talk about the relationship between different accounts of Islam and the ways in which they are connected to democracy and whether or not you could reconcile these two together. Okay, let's go on. Um, fundamentalist reading of Islam, which is the first interpretation, uh, as I mentioned, we could talk about different constituents and components of this reading of Islam. I just try to shed light on it. I'm just trying to shed light on it very quickly. Uh, the first component of fundamentalist Islam can be categorized as the literal reading of the text. The literal reading of the text. By literal reading of the text, I mean they try to just focus on what's in holy text, in Quran, in our, uh, for, with regard to Islam. What is talked about, literally speaking. They don't take into account, they don't care about the localities and spatio-temporal aspects of Islamic ideas and especially Islamic Sharia, Sharia I mean Feb, jurisprudence. And they, they don't care about, I mean, the context dependency, let's say, or the localities of uh, emerging Islam. So they are truly leaving the literalist account of Islam. So according to them, according to them, one by one, one uh, as far as Sharia and as far as as far as Sharia and ideas are concerned, one by one has to be applied and followed. So this is we can call the we can call it as I mentioned the literal reading of Islam. So in this reading, the plurality, diversity, context dependency and localities are not taken into account, they are not considered and talked about, you just have to follow the road one by one, step by step, as it is put in the scripture, the holy scripture. In other words, um, you are not allowed to, in a way, you are not allowed to use your reason alone, or let's say the products of reason alone, in order to see and grasp the justified reading and interpretation of the holy text, i.e. Quran. Just, you have to put it and uh, take it into account word by word and as I mentioned, uh, regardless of the localities and so on and so forth. For instance, when you want to talk about fiqh and sharia and Islamic uh, judgments, Islamic jurisprudence, uh, it's not the case that the uh, presumptions, the metaphysical presumptions, epistemological presumptions, anthropological presumptions have to be talked about and elaborated. No, just you have to put them aside. The whole uh, intellectual investigations in this real have to be put aside and just, as I mentioned, uh, go ahead one by one. Uh, you can talk, you can regard this reading as I mentioned, the fundamentalist reading of Islam, and as you know, it has got a uh, voice, significant voice in the contemporary world, and there are political activists and there are some scholars who do believe in this fundamentalist reading of Islam. According to this account of Islam, Islam and democracy are not reconcilable. Because democracy is one of the products of reason alone, and in a way, there is no such a thing as a democracy which is talked about in the scripture. You have to put it aside, you have to ignore it, or let's say strongly criticize it and, and undermine it. Because it's not talked about such a thing as a democracy. You have got khalafa, you have got something uh, which is the traditional, let's say, government and uh, the ways in which uh, ordinary people are connected to the Khalifa or the king and so on and so forth. Um, which uh, it sounds, let's say, 
a lot platonic account. It sounds platonic in the sense that the way in which, as you know, Plato talks about a philosopher king in his The Republic, and it seems that uh, lots of uh, Islamic scholars, or lots of uh, the ones who are happy with the traditionalist reading of Islam, and sorry, the fundamentalist reading of Islam, uh, think into account this relationship uh, between, well, as far as politics is concerned. If you want, we could talk about and elaborate this part in Q and A. Okay. So this is the uh, first reading of Islam, as I mentioned, which we could, uh, we could regard it as fundamentalist reading. The second reading which uh, is crucial to our current discussion is traditionalist reading. If you regard the first one as the fundamentalist one, you could consider the second as the traditionalist reading of Islam. Traditionalist reading of Islam and the traditionalists try to focus on the esoteric and mystical aspect, the elements of Islamic heritage. So they are not literalists, the same as fundamentalists, as I put it. So they focus on the esoteric and mystical elements of Islam. It seems that though they are happy with modernization, let's say, and the ways in which modern institutions are presented in the modern world, they don't accept modern ideas, theoretically speaking. In other words, there is a dichotomy uh, here, uh, according to the traditionalists, and if you want to formulate their ideas, it seems that you have to pull apart the theoretical aspect and practical aspect. As far as practicalities is concerned, they are happy and they do believe in the modern institutions, let's say, and they are happy with modernization in the sense that they are happy with Western technologies, they try to use it in their everyday life and so on and so forth. But theoretically, though they focus on the esoteric and mystical aspect of Islamic heritage, as I mentioned, they are not happy with, again, the Western ideas and the modern ideas, theoretically speaking. Um, for instance, if you have heard of Descartes, as I mentioned, René Descartes, uh, they don't endorse, they don't accept Cartesian dichotomy and cogito, um, the way in which it is discussed in Western philosophy for about 400 years. They don't buy it at all. Moreover, they are not happy with the instrumental reason and the way in which it is discussed in Western literature as well. Uh, according to them, this kind of approach to reason sounds misleading, and we have to ignore and pull it apart. They, rather, they try to talk about intellect rather than reason, rather than reason alone. They try to talk about intellect and direct relationship um, between the intellect and something which, which um, can be grasped by connecting to the intellect. So reason alone, which emerged 16th century onwards, according to them, is misleading and is something which happened unfortunately in the history of uh, Western culture, let's say. But we, as the ones who are confronted with this Western heritage and Western ideas, we have to be careful and just take, let's say, the modernization and ignore and reject the modern ideas. If you have heard of Sayyid Hossein Nas, for instance, or Shuan, um, or Martin Lings and other uh, scholars and intellectuals, you could categorize them as a traditionalist. They strongly criticize, as I mentioned, um, Western ideas. And according to them, I mean, in a way, um, they think of uh, the revival of Islamic heritage, let's say. They have got a nostalgia, I mean, let's say, nostalgic attitude towards the ancient and pre-modern world and Islam, let's say. According to them, it would be a good idea if we could rehabilitate 
if we could revive that heritage in so far as we can. And they have got they are nostalgic, let's say, with regard to the pre-modern Islam, the pre-modern world, generally speaking. According to them, that was better for sure in comparison what has happened since 400 years and so on and so forth. So both, they are not happy with theoretical reason or reason alone, if you like, on the one hand, and instrumental reason as well. They try to criticize technology, let's say, and the products of reason alone and the way in which it emerged in modern sciences and technologies and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, so as I mentioned, though they are happy with modernization in the sense that they utilize technology, let's say, they are, most of them, they are, li they are living in Western world, for instance, in the US or Canada or other cities and uh, countries, but they strongly criticize Western ideas. Uh, it seems that uh, their ideas with regard to politics or the relationship between Islam and democracy is vague. In a way, they don't strongly criticize human rights as one of the products of Western ideas, or the ideas which are productive, as you well aware, by Western philosophers, sociologists, anthropologists, and so on and so forth. They don't want to, or they are not um, inclined to, strongly and directly criticize these ideas, but in a way they are ambiguous. They don't buy it either. They don't criticize it strongly either. It seems that there is a dubious, let's say, vague attitude toward these ideas. They don't strongly criticize democracy and democratic procedure, but on the other hand, they don't accept or at least explicitly and frankly talk about democracy. They try to just talk about, as I mentioned, the products of Western ideas uh, as far as philosophy or modern sciences are concerned. They don't talk explicitly, to my knowledge, with regard to modern politics, let's say, and whether or not they buy it or put it aside or they want to substitute it with something else. No, there is no such a thing, to my knowledge, and it seems that we could talk about their ideas as a vague and dubious uh, as I mentioned, uh, and mm, as I mentioned, because I mean, in a way, they haven't got any first-hand experience in this regard. Most of them are living in Western countries on the one hand, but strongly criticize what is uh, going on here, theoretically speaking. For if you want to uh, ask, if you ask them, so what is, for instance, what would be the best uh, system of governance? for instance, in Egypt or in Middle East. To my knowledge, they haven't said anything in this regard, and uh, mostly they just focus on, let's say, the side effects of Western ideas, the side effects of Westernization, the side effects of modernization, they, they, though they utilize it, as I mentioned. Uh, you have, for instance, Shuan, uh, Martin Lings, Sayyid Hussein Nas and other intellectuals which they regard them as uh, traditionalists as well. But you have to be aware they are not fundamentalists. That's the crucial thing. As I mentioned, they do believe in the esoteric and mystical heritage of Islam. They don't want to, they don't uh, interpret the Quranic verse. They don't interpret uh, what is said in the scripture or the prophet's uh, tradition literally. They try to go beyond the uh, literal reading and talk about the uh, plurality or uh, universality of the religions and because of that they focus and highlight the, um, local, the, sorry, the uh, mystical elements of the heritage as well. I mean, uh, as far as Modern ideas and uh, ideas which are discussed in humanities, uh, they are not happy with it. For instance, as I mentioned, they strongly criticize Kant, Descartes, and Western philosophy. And instead of that, they try to talk about the intellect. You know, intellect which is uh, intuition, let's say, in a, in a um, religious sense, let's say, in a sacral sense, let's say. So there is no, I mean, secular reason or reason alone which can be 
talked about, or it's uh, unjustified and have to be put aside. Okay, so this is the second interpretation of Islam. And uh, as I mentioned, you could categorize their interpretation of Islam and see the way in which they try to talk about Western ideas and politics. And as I mentioned, uh, they are way in, compar in uh, comparison with the fundamentalists which strongly and explicitly criticize Western ideas generally and democracy, let's say, in particular. Um, even in uh, some Middle East and Islamic countries, they have got some representative, they have got some voice, but it seems that uh, are the ones who live outside the Islamic countries, or at least the prominent and out speaking figures of um, traditionalists, it seems that most of them they live here, okay, or outside the uh, Middle East and Islamic countries. The third interpretation of Islam, which can be dubbed and talked about as a reformist Islam, is different in some respects, as we will see. With, I mean, uh, in comparison with uh, both the fundamentalist reading and the traditionalist reading of Islam, uh, reformist. Muslim or reformist uh, account of Islam, reformist Muslim, they are not literalist on the one hand. The distinction between essentials and accidentals of Islam is very crucial for them. So it means that they do believe the accidentals and essentials in religion because, in a way, they regard it as a socio socially constructed concepts, a phenomenon, so they try to pull apart the localities, let's say, the universalities, and uh, talk about the essentials and accidentals. So for them, this distinction is very crucial. They focus on localities and try to distinct them from the universalities, as I mentioned. They are happy with Western ideas, generally speaking, and because of that, we regard them as reformists, as I mentioned. They accept human rights and do believe, let's say, in political secularism. I will try to elaborate it in a minute. Instead of, instead of political uh, philosophical secularism, for them, most of ethical terms, let's say, most of ethical phrases, most of uh, legal and ethical concepts, they are non-religious in the first place. Though in the scripture some of these concepts and ideas are talked about and elaborated, but they are not religious in the first place. For instance, consider the case and the concept justice. According to them, this is a crucial I think, distinction, justice is a non-religious concept in the first place. So it means that justice is not religious but the other way around the religion is or have to be just or at least I mean or let's say in, a, in other words when you're talking about Sharia and fiqh, jurisprudence as I mentioned and the precepts or um, what uh, jurisprudence talks, uh, talk, talks to talk about it has to be scrutinized and talked about separately. And as I mentioned, justice is not a religious concept in the first place. The other way around, you have to take into account um, and talk about them by taking, uh, by considering the non-religious um, criterion as well. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, they are reformists because of considering human rights as one of the products of reason alone. They do not focus on the literalist, the, the literal aspect of Islam. Just they are they are happy with the, I mean, esoteric and mystical elements, but it's not adequate for them. You have to go further and take into account other uh, ideas and concepts. So, because of that, Western ideas 
comes in in their set of belief, let's say. According to them, in order to talk about the relationship between religion and politics, let's say, which can be talked about here as the relationship between Islam and politics in this context, we have to make a distinction between political secularism and philosophical secularism, let's say. What I mean by Philosophical secularism is that if you interpret the world without taking into account the supreme level, let's say, or without taking into account the transcendence and so on and so forth. So, and in a way, if you interpret what's going on in the world by its own and by at the, just at the natural level, it is, I mean, the philosophical secularism, let's say, or this is the way in which you... Uh, try to interpret what is going on in the real world philosophically or um, sociologically speaking. So, uh, as far as philosophical secularism is concerned, it is not needed to take into account and assume other levels of reality or not talking about the supreme level or sacral things and so on and so forth. So that would be philosophical secularism, let's say. For sure, Muslim reformists or reformist Islam are not is not is not happy with philosophical secularism, let's say. They don't buy this position metaphysically and epistemologically speaking, because they are Muslim in a way. They are Muslim. They are Muslim in the sense that according to them it's not just adequate to talk about at the natural level and your world has to be or is bigger let's say metaphysically speaking so this is philosophical secularism which has got lots of you know voice in the western and demystified world let's say so in the demystified world uh, lots of scholars lots of philosophers sociologists they prefer the secularistic um, and naturalistic explanation of the world 